that crowd, they know who it is. They know the name. The next generation indeed. Next gen. That's his nickname. <laughs> What's up, Steelers fans? A little bit of a more dour atmosphere this morning than we would expect for a victory Monday on the Tuesday, especially following a win over the hated Cleveland Browns. A pall was cast over that victory with uh, Minka Fitzpatrick's injury as we wait to find out what's going on with him. Of course, he uh, initially left after that hit on Nick Chubb that has apparently ended his season. Uh, many people dubbed that hit dirty. Um, I don't see it. I'm sure most, if not all, Steelers fans are in that boat. Um, I'm sure by now you've heard Ryan Clark talking about it. Uh, the guy in good morning America, who was a former defensive back, just pretty much saying like, if you go up high in a, on a, on a runner, on a court, on a running back, on a tight end, on one of those big body dudes, uh, not only is he going to make you look stupid, but then you open yourself up to head injuries, which, um, I mean, I know it doesn't look great with the, when your knee gets bent back like that and you miss an entire season, but um, I think we can all agree that we've gotten to a place with the National Football League where uh, we can all agree that it's better to for your leg to explode than for those repeated head injuries over and over and over, and then you get to be 45 years old, wandering around a grocery store naked like Walter White. We went through all this junk when Gronk was getting his knee blown out over and over because, you know... Uh, you, you try to go, try to take him down by the waist or above, and you know you just slide off, bounce off, and get yourself hurt in the process. Uh, you got to do what you got to do in the National Football League to get a guy on the ground. I think if you ask Chubb himself, uh, he would prefer that you would, uh, maybe not in the moment, but if you ask him 15, 20 years from now, um, I think he's he'll he'll tell you he's glad that Minka took out his knee and not you know bashed his brains to bits. So. Um, you know, it's a contact sport. Uh, bad things are going to happen that you don't want to see that aren't fun to watch. Um, there's not, you got to pick your poison. I hope Chubb can get back to being what he was, uh, just because as a product, the national football league is better when its stars are intact. And, uh, speaking of stars, this may be a clumsy segue, but, um, Deshaun Watson sure doesn't seem like a star quarterback to me. We've seen him a couple times in Cleveland now, just last night and uh, the this, the second matchup last season. He seems to fade in the bigger moments down the stretch when they need him most. I remember that game also ended with a with a bad toss, uh, the, the, the game last year, and then last night on the, uh, uh, in a gotta-have-it fourth down moment, he's got one-on-one -on -one coverage in the si along the sideline with a, with a rookie cornerback and Joey Porter Jr. In a gotta have a moment like that, you got to give your guy a chance to make a play. And speaking of Deshaun Watson, the, the, the stiff arms to the face, there were two of them last night. There was at least one in the game last year. This is a pattern at this, at this point with this guy. Browns fans want to talk about how Minka is dirty. How about Deshaun Watson putting his hand into defenders' face face masks, holding it there for 10, 15, 20, 35 seconds, carrying the guy all the way to the sideline, and then using the face mask to throw him into the bench as he did to, um, uh, uh, not, I think that was Casey, but later he did the same thing to Herbig where he r rode the face mask for way too long and then threw the guy to the ground with the face mask. I don't see any way you can argue that that's not a guy... If it happens one time, you try to stiff arm a guy, you get his, your finger caught in his face mask, whatever. When it happens twice, when he's doing the exact same thing, when he's using the face mask to control a guy and then using it to throw a guy on the ground, uh, that's a pattern at that point. That's something... I mean, I, I don't want to... I started this podcast talking about how you can't call Minka dirty for one dirty hit. Can you call a guy dirty for two dirty hits? Going back to last year, he did it again. It's a pattern at this point with this guy. If you're going to start throwing stones about Minka being dirty, take a look in your own backyard, buddy. And be, you can't claim you didn't know this wasn't who this guy was when he came in. Because what, what, regardless of what he's doing on the field with face masks, grabbing people's face masks, you knew that he was dirty off the field. You knew who this guy was. The things he never tried to deny, the things he's never apologized for, at least to my memory, you shouldn't be surprised with what you've gotten in this dude. The only thing you should be surprised is that after everything you've given up for him, he looks to be barely above scrub level. As you look at the, the quarterback comparison in that game last night, uh, Deshaun Watson did not outplay uh, Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett, again, through two games of the season, playing two of the top four or five defenses in the NFL, has looked like a bad quarterback. 
Um, but I think a the the lion's share of that is not on Kenny Pickett's shoulders. It's on the uh, the offensive line, the protection they've been able to give him. He he was running scared all week last week, and for good reason. Uh, this week, more of the same. For the second week in a row, people are placing the blame for this dismal offense squarely at the feet of the offensive coordinator. And uh, I don't want to make this a weekly thing of going to bat for Matt Canada, but uh, the, the line that we saw last night was so below the line, was so junior varsity, to borrow Mike Tomlin term, that, I mean, especially on the edges with Miles Garrett, especially Dan Moore on the left edge, but especially, especially on the interior, it seemed like all night they had guys in the in the A gaps who were who were through the through that gap and into the backfield, making Kenny Pickett's night hell. Uh, you know, before the offensive linemen were even out of their stances. There's only two ways to to time up a snap that well, and that's either you guess or you know the snap count. And uh, there's zero chance that they were guessing that consistently all night long. It seemed like they knew exactly when the snap was coming. And that's on the quarterback for not recognizing that and not going to a hard count. And, you know, should one of the coaches have noticed that too and said something to him and, you know, suggested he go to the hard count? Sure. That's one of the things that you do as a coach as training wheels for a rookie quarterback. And at a certain point, it becomes his job to start recognizing these things on his own and making his own adjustment because he sees the field differently under center the way that he surveys it. Then Matt Canada sees it up in the booth and Mike Tomlin sees it from the sideline. I mean, there's certain things that only the quarterback can see, and it's his job to make the adjustment to. We can keep putting the blame on Matt Canada and keep scapegoating uh, the offensive line, which needs to get better. Keep scapegoating Kenny Pickett, which, I mean, we saw him do it in the preseason. We saw this line do it in the preseason. We saw Matt Canada do it in the preseason. So why is it not working now? I don't know. Maybe it could be because two of these, these in these first two games, we've played two of the top four defenses in the NFL. Is Dan Moore a bad player? Is uh, Levi Wallace a bad football player? Uh, is Quan Alexander a bad football player? No. These are these are decent to good football players who you know when you come up against elite elite competition like Miles Garrett, like Deshaun Watson, like uh, Amari Cooper. They're going to make plays on you, and, you know, it doesn't make you a bad football player to give up plays to elite football players. You can be a very good football player and get got by someone who's a little bit better. I'm sick of seeing people on Twitter saying, Levi Wallace is terrible, Quan Alexander is terrible. Like, they, they missed one play, they missed one tackle, they missed... One block, in Dan Moore's case. Dan Moore missed one block a couple times, but, you know... We've seen him be fairly solid against non-Miles Garrett level competition. When guys are going up against a TJ Watt, they're going to look a lot worse at football than when they're going up against, I don't know, a, a Marcus Golden, a, an Ola Adenia, a, you know, I don't pick these guys as the antithesis to the elite player, but, you know, these are players who we've seen, especially... Ola had that crazy preseason a few years ago. We've seen them do it at a high level. Once again, the undrafted running back Jalen Warren outplayed the first-round draft pick Najee Harris, which is starting to get a little disheartening. Um, Najee appears to be making a concerted effort to run with patience, which is something that we appreciate the heck out of Le'Veon Bell for. But Bell had a much better offensive line, and when he was being patient, he was waiting for blocks to develop. And when Najee's doing it, it seems like he's just waiting for blocks to break down and to be to be swarmed in the backfield there. So um, it seems like Jalen Warren's running style may be more compatible with this line as it is, but the the vision obviously of Mike Tomlin and the Steelers organization and Matt Canada. Uh, what they're trying to do is be that run-forward team who can run it at you with four different guys from six different directions with 12 different misdirections they could wrinkle in on, a in on top of it. I feel like if the Eagles were to run the Matt Canada offense, they'd do just fine at it because they have the interchangeable running backs, the line to block it up, and most importantly, the speed to take the top off of defenses. Uh, when defenses are afraid of your verticality, your ability to get on top of them, they have to play you much uh, looser, they have to allow all the underneath stuff um, 
And uh, but when you're the Steelers and you don't have the speed to get on top of to take the top off of defenses, and they don't have to you know be afraid of that dimension of the game they can sit hard on the underneath stuff they can break on those quick breaking routes they can break up passes they can hawk balls they can create splash and turnovers so to survive when all you can do offensively is within 15 20 yards of the line of scrimmage you have to make them cover sideline to sideline you have to stretch the field laterally you have to do the jet motions and sweeps and all that nonsense that uh, Matt Canada has to resort to because uh, for years now the Steelers have not had that deep play threat and uh, we thought Calvin Austin would become that guy. I don't know if, I mean, he had a couple moments in the preseason, but um, against, I guess, top tier competition, I don't know if they're taking him away. I know the Browns said pregame that their their goal in this game was to take him away. I saw a lot of people say on Twitter that the Steelers defense looked terrible, and you have to remember they're going up against a pretty good offense there, so judge on the sliding scale. But um, I think the best way to characterize them is they're an elite pass rush. You saw that with uh, TJ and Alex and Ogan Joby. And uh, you don't force five turnovers, uh, six if you count uh, turnovers on downs. Uh, you don't force six turnovers for defense unless you're get unless you you're making the quarterback's life hell. Soft in coverage, I'd say, especially with Minka down. Um, Levi Wallace has gotten some uh, an undue level of hate. He's, he's not a, an elite quarterback by any means, uh, but in short areas down near the red zone, and especially in zone, he's great with his eyes on the quarterback. And when you don't have to, resp uh, when you don't have to be afraid of uh, guys running away from you and getting behind you, uh, he can be very effective. And he's quite good in those short areas. He just gets exposed a little bit in the when there's too much green to handle. Another missed tackle last night in the long touchdown run, similar to the the play in the um, the Christian McCaffrey touchdown from last week. When you step on a football field, there are a lot of things that are asked of you. And you're very good at a number of those things and a number of those other things you're not so good at. So Levi Wallace has, is, good, is good enough at the things he's good at to keep his starting spot. We're one and one. So is Cleveland. Uh, we're right in, the, we're right in the, uh, the heart of this division right now. We're still in the race. Uh, do things have to get better on both sides of the ball? Yes. Uh, we need to hope for some good luck with injuries, especially with Minka. Last night, the way he was coughing and throwing up on the sideline, I immediately thought, you know, perforated lung. I saw some other medical opinions of, to, along those same lines on Twitter. So we haven't gotten any confirmation yet, so we have to keep our fingers crossed. But uh, six to eight weeks would be the timetable expected on that if that were a, 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 a fractured rib and punctured lung situation. And uh, on top of missing Cam Hayward and Deontay Johnson, that would be another giant blow for this team the bottom line is we beat the browns last night it may not have been as, as pretty as it could have been may have lost a little bit more than we we feel like we gained at this point but uh you know a win is a win and we'll take it and we'll move forward and you know, we'll just get back in the lab and try to f find out how we can start stacking w's because you know this win loss win loss win loss stuff that's not going to get you where you need to go yeah.